position. If you're not driving, uh, make sure you have your notepad in front of you, your pen in front of you, your Bible in front of you, and make sure you got your attitude right. Amen. As we prepare to de dig into the word of God, uh, Brother Hamilton is one of the most gifted um, men of God, teachers and preachers, not only in our brotherhood, but in, in Christendom. And so we're, we're excited about what God is going to use him to do even right now, but let's prepare for the investment and let's 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 pull up uh, and really be a part of what we're what we're about to experience through him as we hear from the man of God 
out of the word of God to encourage the people of God. Brother J.K. Thank you, Brother Thomas. Um, and thank you for this invitation to uh, be a part of this endeavor, this series on Faith Factor. Good morning to everyone. Um, extra strength, good morning from, from Dallas, because we are an hour behind you guys. So uh, an extra strength, good morning. And uh, we, we certainly appreciate this. And uh, Thomas, thank you. And it's so good uh, to be able to connect on this venue. I think this venue became very, of course, we know it became very useful, profitable, and um, um, uh, typical uh, since since COVID. So I want to kind of get right into it. Uh, the, the theme you all have is faith factor, and um, we can go so many places regarding the topic and the theme of faith. Uh, we can uh, go to faith um, in God, faith uh, in ourselves, uh, but not self-dependency. Uh, but the, the 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 genre, if you would, of of the teaching of faith and the topic of faith uh, goes in so many directions. But I want us to begin today with the foundation of faith, evolving in faith toward God. I believe while God is everything who He is all the time. Um, evolution is not a word that can ever be used of God. God doesn't evolve. However, we are people who evolve. God uh, can't get better. He, he can't be any more than he was yesterday. Uh, he, uh, when God wanted to evolve, he took on human flesh. Jesus is not an evolution, if you would. Um, but God himself... Um, without coming to, to into a body and being uh, incarnate, uh, doesn't evolve. From everlasting to everlasting, he's God. Um, he can only be God. He, he is incapable of learning because he's uh, omniscient. Um, but we, in our human experience and in our humanity, evolve in faith. It's a, it's a growth process. Uh, and in that, I want to talk about uh, faith's foundation in that evolution, because before we talk about faith to do this and faith to do that and faith in God for us to accomplish, I want to go to the bedrock of, of faith. Um, and the bedrock of faith for the redeemed person, for the child of God, for the person who has been called out of darkness into his marvelous light, uh, is that uh, his faith is not uh, the desire or faithfulness of himself or man, but the nature and character of God. Faith's bedrock is the nature and the character of God. <clears throat> um, without an object of faith that is faithful, then all faith is in vain. Um, so what's the bedrock of faith? The nature and character of God. We trust God because of who he is, his nature and character. So when in our evolution of faith, we disconnect from our learning about the nature and character of God, it begins to tinker with our faith. This is how uh, God is um, humanized, and we are, we we can end up projecting on God uh, what we project on man, because we we disconnect from God's nature and God's character. Uh, there are so many people, even in uh, among believers, um, who rewrite God, who recreate God, and who give Him a nature that cosigns things that God does not cosign. Um, the world we live in has created a subjective God, a God that uh, that they have formed in their mind. In Romans chapter 1, it uh, talks about, uh, beginning with verse 18 on, talks about those heathens and the heathens 
serve the uh, creature more than the creator by making gods out of out of images and 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 four legged beasts and all of that kind of stuff. And when you do that, you subject the true nature of God to the nature of man. And 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 of course, God only is worth an object to put your faith in only as far as man is if we don't stay connected to the nature and the character of God. Our faith is founded on his faithfulness. Our faith is founded on his faithfulness. What's interesting is our love is founded on his love. There are attributes of God that's that serve as the bedrock for the attributes that we reflect. Um, like, for instance, even love. The Bible says uh, it's not that um, we love God, but that he first loved us. So you take the God who doesn't evolve, who is everything he is, and we, we, we build ourselves on his character and his nature. So if you want to know how to love, Look at how God loves. If you want to know what faithfulness is, God is the foundation uh, of faithfulness. So the first thing coming out, uh, coming out of the of the gate, is understanding that God is faithful. His His presence in His deeds. Uh, Lamentations three twenty two twenty three. You've heard this. Great is Thy faithfulness. We're not even talking about our faith. We're talking about his faithfulness. Our faith is a moot point if we if we don't understand and we don't embrace and we don't pursue a knowledge of the character and the faithfulness of God. First Corinthians 10, 11 through 13, you know, let him that thinketh he standeth uh, take heed lest he fall, you know. Um, God, it's, it's, it says, um, God will not um, I'll put any more on us than, uh, uh, than, than we are able to bear, but God is faithful. Who will whip the, t there's no temptation that's overtaken you, but such as a common man, but God is faithful. God is faithful. Why would Paul interject God is faithful? Because before any human's faith is highlighted, what first must be highlighted is the faithfulness of God. And the thing and, and the thing we need to embrace is before God is faithful to us, he is faithful to himself, okay? He is faithful to himself. And what does that mean? That means God has perfect integrity. When God says it, he does it, not because we heard him say it, but because he said it. He has perfect integrity. Um, if God, watch this perfect integrity, if it's in his mind, it's just as good as done. His faithfulness, his integrity, he's faithful to himself. And that's something um, that's, that's difficult for us uh, because the world has created a God that is faithful to us before he's faithful to himself. In other words, he's become a celestial Santa, Santa Claus of sorts who, you know, we trust him because when we called on him, when we asked him, when we petitioned him, he came through. Uh, and this is erroneous in its, in its, uh, and fundamentally erroneous. God is faithful to his own word. And if God is faithful to himself and his word, in order for us to embrace full faith in God, we have to become familiar with who God is faithful to, and that's himself and his own word. So when you're not, when you're not familiar and you're not acquainted with his word, you, you begin, a person begins to expect out of God what he never promised, what he never committed to be faithful to, because he's faithful to himself. So the more we understand the nature and character of God is the more we understand what to ask for, what we are, what we have access to. Um, God is God will never respond to man contrary 
to his own faithfulness. Okay, so God is first faithful to himself. Um, faith cannot be used as a manipulative, manipulative tool to get God to give us what we want. I trust the God. I trust God. Like, for instance, he's faithful to his own will. Right. If God says it's time to come home and that's in the mind of God. His sovereignty overrides our desire. That's his faithfulness to himself. His sovereignty overrides our desire. But watch that. Watch this. You remember King Hezekiah, who I, God sent Isaiah to uh, to tell to get your house in order? Well, watch this. He's faithful to himself. Um, God turned Isaiah right back around after Hezekiah prayed and faced the wall and told him, look, you got 50 more, four more days. The reason why we cannot protest God is because God is always faithful to himself, to his own will. And when we align our will with his, then, um, we understand his faithfulness toward us. His faithfulness toward us is always founded on his faithfulness to himself. Next, God is faithful to his word and not ours, his word and not ours. This is an elaboration of what I just said. He is faithful to who he is and not to who we want him to be, right? Isaiah 55, 8 through 11, you know, um, Isaiah says it, says it like this, and I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. Isaiah records God as saying, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you can imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than yours and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. The rain and snow come down from the heavens and stay on the ground to water the earth. They cause the grain to grow, producing seed for the farmer and bread for the hungry. It is the same with my word. I send it out and it always produces fruit. It will accomplish all I want it to, and it will prosper everywhere I send it. It will accomplish everything I want it to. Do you see this? Now, this almost looks con contradictory to, you know, if you, you know, you know, you pray to the Lord, God to give it to you. No, no, his word first accomplishment, accomplishment accomplishes all that he wants it to. If it were the way the world would have it, it would say, I, you know, it is the same with my word. I send it out and it always produces fruit. It will accomplish all that you want it to. That's, that's not how it works. That's the world we live in. Um, and so when God in his sovereignty says no, that we uh, uh, to something we request of him, a lot of people in the world give up believing in God be because they they somehow twisted this thing around and um, made God faithful to our word first and our will first. And that's not what God is. He's faithful to his own own word and his own will. Faith in his nature and character. Watch this. His faithfulness, that's his character. He is reliable, right? His eternal existence, right? That's his nature. He is reliable always. So his nature is, his character is he is faithful. His nature is that he is eternal. And since his nature is eternal, his faithfulness can't be anything other than what his nature is. Now, this has to do with the attributes of God and everything about God is in line with, you know, everything about God's character is in perfect sync with everything about God's nature. Um, it is called double-mindedness. It's good that you that was read. Double-mindedness is when there is a variance between character and nature. Right, it creates limitation. A character, you can have a good character, but if you, you know, the reason why it will not be superior is because we don't have the nature of God. 
We can say we love each other. We can say, listen, I won't leave you to, to, to those, our children and our families. But, you know, that's our character, right? You know, our character is, you know, you know we're, we're going to be here. But the problem is we don't have an eternal nature and uh, an eternal existence. So uh, is it a broken promise when a father or mother tells a child, look, I'm going to be here with you. Um, I'll be with you forever. We can't make that kind of promise. Our character can, but our nature will, will fail in that because we don't have the nature to support that characteristic. God, however, is, is worth putting our faith in because his character and his nature are in perfect sin. You know, God loves me always. God is always his eternal existence, right? His nature that is that he's immutable, which means God is not going to be faithful to me today and not faithful to me tomorrow. He's, he's unchanging. Um, we, we are not immutable. <laughs> you know, we change, which is why, which is the whole purpose of the cross, a God perfect in character and nature reaches down to a man with flawed character and uh, limited nature. And if you want to see man with flawed character and flawed and unflawed nature and unflawed character, he demonstrates that in Christ, everything Christ is and everything, um, every characteristic he like like God, right? That he's human. Here's a very interesting phenomenon, which is that God is so faithful that even Satan attempts to use his faithfulness against us as the accuser. Satan will use God's faithfulness against he, the, the object of his love, us, okay? And what does that look like? What does that look like? It looks like this. You remember in Job, I'll start with Job. Um, this is the, the Satan doing it directly. Job 1 and 2, right? Um, God and Satan, Satan and God have this conversation. And uh, he says... Does the Job fear you for naught? You know, you have a hedge around him. Um, but if you um if you remove the hedge, he will curse you to your face. Um, um and of course, what Satan is depending on is that God is faithful so faithful that if he removes this hedge from Job, he's going to have to deal with Job differently because Satan also knows God's faithfulness and integrity, right? So, so all through Job, you see Satan making these attempts to attack Job by challenging not Job's faith first, but God's faith, his faithfulness. He's challenging God's faithfulness before he challenges Job's faith. Um, here's another one, Daniel 6, 8 through 12. There were men who did not like him because God was elevating him. And this is now from through Satan to man, right? Daniel prays and he is faithful to God, right? And he's praying three times a day. So the only way they can accuse Daniel is in the area of his faithfulness toward God. So here's examples of how a faithfulness used as accusatory manipulation, right? So I will I will manipulate you based on your faithfulness. And of course, John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11, we see it with Christ, Matthew chapter 4. So even God knows, even Satan knows that God is faithful. So he tries to and attempts to get us to be unfaithful because 
If we are unfaithful, God still has to be faithful to himself. And God says that the soul that's in it, it will die. God says that, you know, I, I will punish sin. But what Satan did not realize and recognize is that God is the kind of God that can retain his faithfulness and still be faithful to, to flawed man. Okay. Um, there's a movie out. And I want to recommend it if you haven't seen it already. Uh, it's called Nefarious. I don't know if any of you have seen that. It's on Amazon Prime. And um, there's a gentleman there who, on the out, from the outside to a therapist, looks like he has mental problems, but he's possessed um, by a demon. And... Um, there is this there is this dialogue between the man, the demon in the man speaking, and this psychiatrist. And he says, you know, we uh, we 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 God created man in his image, but because man had free will, we were able to create man in our image. And he says, well, well, if we're all doomed, then then what is that? You know, then what are you still pursuing? He says, there's one problem. The problem was the carpenter. He says, the cross was our biggest mistake. Said, meant by them. He says, the cross was our biggest mistake. Because through the cross, the accuser could not successfully accuse humanity based on the faithfulness of God, because God showed his faithfulness on by, by, by allowing and putting to grief his son for the sins of man. So God gets to be faithful and merciful toward us, and yet faithful to himself by punishing sin. So, you know, it's the, the dialogue is beautiful, and we always talk about the cross from the angle of God, but, 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 uh, but it, it was God's permissive will to allow the, the, the enemy and the accuser to, uh, and the God of this world to navigate events and circumstances and, 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 and the predicaments that led to the cross, thinking that it, it was destroying God's plan but it was actually bringing it to fulfillment because even Satan knows that God is faithful to his own word. So if Satan believes and knows that he's faithful to his word and uses it against us to accuse us, right? Uses it to say, look, you said, God, you said that you would punish sin. Humanity has messed up. But again, it's about the faithfulness of God. And so before we talk about, you know, um, us needing to be strengthened in our faith, we, it is, it is unlikely that we will be strengthened in our faith if we're not strengthened in our knowledge of the character and nature of God. That has to be first. That is the bedrock of faith. That is the foundation of our faith. And when we understand God's character, and we understand God's nature, it strengthens our faith because we know a little something about who we're putting our faith in. And I'm going to end uh, at that point. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, um, we need you. Uh, you are a God who we can trust because you are faithful. Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness even when ours is lacking. Great is your faithfulness before we were even created. Great is your faithfulness. And because you are God who has great faithfulness, we can put our faith in you. Help us to remind ourselves of how faithful you are when we are in situations that look challenging, that look hopeless. Help us to understand that we serve a God who will always do what he says. Help us to stay on the right side of that. 
help us not to tempt you uh, through your faithfulness. Protect us from the evil one when he tries to accuse us by way of your faithfulness. And Lord, when the time comes for the clouds to get between us and the sun, when the time comes for trials to line up one by one to tempt us and to vex our soul, may we remember your faithfulness. May we remember your character. May we never accuse you of not being faithful because of your answer and how, what you allow and what your will is. But may we always trust in your faithfulness. You're good, not just some of the time, but all of the time. And that's your character. And help us to know that you're good when things are not good. We bless your name in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Thomas. I appreciate it. So glad to be uh, a part of this. This is very unique. This is a commitment on so many levels. And uh, certainly it's um, it's wonderful to see. Uh, this morning, I'm going to, there are certain texts that um, are signature texts for me in my life. Uh, and, and perhaps they would help you in your life. We're talking about the faith factor. And I want to today. I don't. I don't have a full PowerPoint. We're just gonna kind of get into the Word with you, and then we'll we'll get into what God has to say. I want to encourage you to take this very personal. Whenever we're in the Word, to take it personal, even if you feel like the application is not relevant in this space and in this season, to take it very personal. I can't tell you how many times I've heard something. Uh, uh, a month ago that was preparing me for something that was going to take place a month later. And so it is very important uh, to take it personal. This is a uh, logos program. We're talking about the fear, the, the faith factor. And of course, I believe that the opposite is the flesh factor. Sometimes we put faith up against fear and, and fear is actually on a spiritual plane, the product of flesh. Uh, so it's not faith versus fear. When a person uh, doesn't walk by faith, uh, they're walking by flesh. And uh, included in flesh is fear. Included in faith is confidence. Okay. Included in flesh is fear. Included in faith is confidence. And so, again, this text right here, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. For we live by believing and not seeing, simply put. We live by believing and not seeing. Now, it, um, I could, we can start this out and talk about walk by faith and not by sight, which is the J King James rendering of it. But it's very important to understand Scripture in their context so that we don't make it mean what we want it to mean. Even in the, fi in the faith factor, we cannot, we do not have the right to take a scripture and throw it up against any context, even in our lives, right? So, you know, we walk by faith and not by sight. I'm, I'm praying to get the job and I'm walking by faith and not by sight. We have a lot of priorities that are not really God's priority for us. They're, they're our priorities. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't operate in faith in those spaces. I'm saying, as we said yesterday, the foundation of our faith is God's. God's will, what God desires, what God wants for us, what God is working out for us. And sometimes we attribute our, and we project our desires and, and on God. And uh, God is, while God will bless you with the job, it's never the job where God will bless you with, you know, um, with a car. It's never about the car. Uh, it's never about the things that are tangible and that we sometimes hold in high esteem. And so in order to grab this um, out of this context, uh, in its context, uh, we, we, we want you to, to see that Paul is not talking about, you know, 
things that most people apply this to. Paul is giving a uh, he's giving a basically a a teaching to the church in Corinth um, about new bodies. He's giving a teaching about the fact that um, our bodies are temporary and we have something outside of our bodies uh, that we uh, have faith for, right? He's talking about death, really. He's talking about the cessation of our bodies. He's talking about the temporary things of life. If I was going to put this in a category, I would talk about temporary things. It's easy and, and, and it's common to have faith about things that are temporary, but our faith should lead us to something more permanent, right? So he says, we know of our earthly hours of this time. And this is my favorite text. So pardon me. And I've, 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 I've taught it in different ways. I've preached it from different angles because this is a, a text that I appreciate more based on its context. Paul writing to the church in Corinth is talking about bodies, our bodies, our temporal bodies. We know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, that is when we die, you know, we, we will have, he said, we will have, we will have a house in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God, not made, you know, not by human hands. We grow weary in our present bodies and we long to put on our, uh, on our new bodies like new clothing for we will put on heavenly bodies. Now, this doesn't really sound interesting, especially if you're going through trials and tribulations and 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 temptations and you're having hardships and there's sickness and then there's there's you know there there's uh uh difficulties in life. But we cannot watch this, we cannot make this text in verse number seven apply to something else first. The principle works across the board. Anything temporary, anything temporary, of course, in this text, he's talking about our bodies and getting new bodies. Anything temporary, we can have faith that there's something more permanent, right? If you're in a temporary trial, there's something, there's a grace that's more permanent. If you're in a temporary tribulation, there's something more, more permanent that's, that's better. Uh, if you're in a temporary crisis, there's something more permanent that's better. If you're in a trauma, there's something more permanent that's better. And in this text, he's talking about our bodies. But if it applies to our bodies, it applies to our trials. It applies to our tribulations. It applies to our crises. It applies to our trauma. It applies to our, our, our hardships. Because the principle is, while we're dealing with something that is temporary and that is not perfect, we 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 are always confident that we have another something that's going that's better than what we're dealing with now. So if we took the principle from this. Uh, it is we have something now that is temporary. How many of us are in some temporary fix right now? Okay, Paul is talking about the body, but it applies to anything that's temporary that we have that we have to cope with, that's beginning to uh, decay, that's beginning to change, that's beginning to be difficult to deal with. And the confidence we have is based on verse seven, where he says, we live by believing and not by seeing. So Paul is talking about these temporary bodies. He calls it a tent. He says, you know, in King James, he says, for we know of our earthly house of this tabernacle be dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, right? If our earthly tabernacle. Heaven is not what he's talking about. He's talking about the capacity to live in heaven, right? He's not saying we have a building of God, a house not made with heaven, and that building of God is heaven. No, he's saying we have a body that can handle heaven, right? We have a body that God prepares for us so that we can live in heaven because it would be a it would be a sad thing to have these bodies in an eternal place right to cope with all of the afflictions 
to cope with all of the all of the sicknesses and illnesses. So God is going to have and has for us another body for an eternal place. And we have confidence in this. And the reason why we have confidence in this is for we live by believing and not by seeing. That's the principle of the text. And the principle uh, beyond the text is that there's always something better and we can have confidence about confidence about it because we live by believing and not seeing. I hope we're, we're understanding that. So Paul is writing and he's talking about leaving these bodies behind uh, and he's talking about having confidence because we walk by believing and not seeing. Now there's a thing called, uh, there's a thing called, and I dealt with this before, there's a thing called faith reality and there's a thing called uh, tangible reality, okay? Sight reality, there's faith reality, and tangible reality. The faith factor is not that we are in denial about what we see. Let me, if you're taking notes, write that down. You and I, God doesn't encourage us to be in denial about the difficult things we have going on. Faith is not saying that what we see is not real. That's not what faith does. It does not say that what we see is not real. If you look through scripture, Goliath was real. Goliath was a real giant. David having faith was not him saying, you know, I believe and trust in God and this man is not real because faith does not deny reality or or tangible reality or transparent reality. Faith, watch this. It does not deny transparent reality. It defies transparent reality. It doesn't deny it. It defies it. It doesn't deny it, it defies it, okay? What does that mean? It means that being in denial is not faith, my brothers and my sisters. Walking by faith and not by sight, walking by believing and not by seeing is not saying that what you see in your tangible reality is not real. And this is important because there are some things in our, trans in our apparent reality and in our tangible reality that are not good. They're not good. They're difficult. Um, you know, um, illness, illness is one, right? It's not saying, you know, that doctor doesn't know what he's talking about. Faith is not saying, you know, I'm not accepting that. Faith is not saying that, you know, uh, when the IRS comes and says, you owe so much money, <laughs> uh, that's not saying I'm, gonna, I'm just going to ignore them because I trust God. No. There has to be a tangible, uh, apparent reality that faith defies. It, in other words, it says, faith says that in spite of what I'm seeing, I'm going to walk by what I believe. In spite of what I'm seeing, in spite of the reality that's before me, I'm going to walk by what I'm, I'm, I believe. Now watch this. I want to go, and this this is Paul talks about this throughout um, this particular text and the chapter even before. Now watch this, verse sixteen. I don't see my mouse. That is why we never give up. Okay, that is why we never give up. Um, though our bodies are dying, you see this, though our bodies are dying. Now that's hard. We don't, we don't like applying this verse to what Paul applies it to. This is a, we walk by faith and not by sight is not, I'm going to get that job verse or, you know, I'm going to get, you know, I'm, a, I'm God is going, I'm, I'm getting this house. No, it's about the temporary nature of our bodies and the fact that all of us are in the process of dying, our bodies are, which is, now watch this, which is the ultimate challenge, which is the ultimate crisis, which is the ultimate thing to deal with. New jobs, you know, I'm, I know I'm going to get this, uh, you know, I'm gonna, I know I'm going to get a good doctor's report, all of that is good. But the ultimate thing we're dealing with is that we're leaving here. All of us are leaving here. 
there are people on, that uh, would have been on this Zoom two or three years ago that are not here. Why? Because we are leaving here. And Paul says, though our bodies are dying, watch this, that's the, that's the tangible apparent reality. Our bodies are dying. Now watch the faith reality. Our spirits are being renewed day by day. Do you see that? There's, there are two realities here. And to walk by sight is to walk by your apparent tangible reality. It is to say that the only thing I have in front of me is part, is this part. Is to say that's the only thing I have in front of me. Right? Our bodies are dying. You know how hopeless that leaves us to only deal with the apparent realities of life, to only deal with the things we can see, to only deal with the crises and the trauma and the tribulation and the trials and the difficulties and the hardships that we see. People who, watch this, who uh, trust God do not look or stay suspended in a trans, uh, an apparent reality in a tangible reality. You don't say stay suspended there. There is another alternative. And the other alternative happens, watch this, at the same, it's happening at the same time that the apparent reality is, is happening. Our faith reality is happening at the same time that our apparent reality is happening. Again, let me say this. Our faith reality is happening at the same time that our apparent reality is happening and vice versa. Our bodies are dying. That's happening. Our spirits are being renewed day by day. That's happening. Our, our present troubles are small and won't last uh, uh, very long, yet they produce a greater weight of glory. So we don't look at the troubles, and I cannot. I'm, okay, there we go. There we are. Uh, we don't look at the troubles we can see now. That's it. That's the apparent reality. It's tangible. We can see it. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. Both of them happen at the same time. There are two realities working at the same time for our lives. Does that make sense? Two realities happening at the same time for the child of God. There's a faith reality. There's an apparent reality. Those who don't walk by faith and only walk by sight, only deal with the things they see. And, and this comes out in our language. We talk about our problems and that's it. We talk about our issues and that's it. We talk about our trauma and that's it. We talk about, hey, I lost the job. We talk about, hey, this is happening. Uh, we talk about the divorce and not the fact that God is working, has worked strength and through this. We talk about every situation in our apparent reality. When you meet a child of God that only talks about their trouble that they have in their apparent reality, then you are talking to a child of God that is not walking by faith. He's walking by sight, and it comes out in our language. When we are walking by sight, it comes out in our language. It comes out in our language. Now, I want to show you something. Uh, I, I'm going to go through another text, and I love this, and I hope this is helping somebody. But if you ever wonder, have you been in a period in your life where where you only were talking about your problems, and you only were talking about your trouble, and you were only talking about your sickness, and you were only talking about your job loss, and you were only talking about your fi financial situation, um, and not seeing God in it? That's that. That's that. Walking by sight, walking by flesh, walking by uh, an apparent reality. Right? So, um, right here in Second Kings chapter six, and I, I've loved this. This is this is something that has helped me. Is helping me. I remind myself of. Okay. I want to start with verse eight. It says, when the king of Aaron was at war with Israel, many of you know this story, he would confer with his officers and say, we will mobilize our forces. And this is, you know, this is about Elisha, right? Um, uh, at such and such a place, right? 
But immediately, Elisha, the man of God, would warn the king of Israel, do not go near that place, for the Arameans are planning to mobilize their troops there. So the king of Israel would send word to the place indicated by the man of God. Time, at, time and again, Elisha warned the king so that he would be on the alert there. The king of Aram became very upset over this. He called his officers together and demanded, which of you is the traitor? Uh, who has been informing the king of Israel of my plans? It's not us, my lord king. One of the officers replied, Elisha, the prophet of Israel, tells the king of Israel, when the words you speak, uh, even the words you speak in the privacy of your bedroom. So now the man of God is, is, is being called out, right? Because Elisha is prophesying and telling the king of Israel how to evade all of the traps and snares of the king of Aram, right? Go and find out where he is, the king commanded, so I can send troops to seize him. And the report came back. Elisha is at Dothan. So one night, the king of Aram sent a great army with many chariots and horses to surround the city when the servant of the man of God. Now, here, here's, here's where, we, where we're landing. When the servant of the man of God, and this is talking about Elisha's servant, when the servant of the man of God got up early the next morning and went outside, here's the apparent reality. There were troops, horses, and chariots everywhere. The Arameans had surrounded them, right? Oh, sir, what will we do now? The young man cried to Elisha. Remember, I said that when we are walking by sight in our apparent or tangible reality, it comes out in our language. It comes out in our language. What are we going to do now? Now watch, watch this. And when we are walking by faith, it comes out in our language. Don't be afraid. So you have Elisha's, you have Elisha's, don't be afraid. And you have um, the servants you have Elisha's, don't be afraid, right here. That's what you have here. And you have the servants. Oh, sir, what will we do now? <laughs> Watch this. And many of us may be suspended sometimes between what are we going to do now and don't be afraid. We are the community sometimes uh, of what are we going to do now and don't be afraid. Those who walk by faith have begin, begin to speak it in their language. Those who are having a challenge and begin to look at the tangible apparent reality, speak it. So he's saying, what are we going to do now? Elijah's saying, don't be afraid. And then he says, for there are more that be on our side than on there. Then Elisha prayed, oh Lord, open his eyes and let him see. The Lord opened the young man's eyes. And when he looked, he saw the hillside around Elisha filled with horses and chariots of fire. So that's what he sees. He sees uh, that God had them covered. But it took Elisha praying for his servant to not operate in a space of apparent reality, of tangible reality, to not only see what's visible, but to see what's promised, not only see what's visible and see what the situation in its tangible, apparent nature, but to see what's, what's going on by, by the eyes of your faith. And this is the battle of the faith factor. The battle of the faith factor is that we have the flesh factor. What's going on with you? This is going on with me. I've got trouble at home. I've got trouble on my job. I've got trouble with my health. I've got trouble with my finances. That is a real, apparent, tangible reality. But what does your faith say? Faith factor defies that. Yes, I have trouble with my finances, but my God shall supply all my need according to my riches and his riches and glory. Yes, I have trouble with my health, but my God is a healer. And, 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 and God is able uh, to keep me. 
Yes, I have trouble with, with my family and, and other things, but, I, you know, the peace of God will guard my heart and mind. We have to let our faith go to war with our flesh, which means we have to let the words of our faith reality go to war with our apparent reality. It has to go to war. And I want you and all of us to practice this this very day. When your tangible apparent reality manifests something that is not the best thing, I dare you to go to war and let your faith reality go to war with your apparent reality. This is the faith fact that I will not only deal with what I see, but I will deal with what God said. I will not only posture myself by what's going on in my apparent reality. I'm going to speak from my faith reality into my apparent tangible reality, and I will defy what's going on. Okay. Have you ever talked to somebody who was in a situation and the expectation that you had was for them to be depressed and they're not? For them to be down and they're not. Have you ever talked to a brother and sister in Christ who should have been down and should have been depressed because of their situation, but they were not? And they just said they put it in God's hands and they're trusting God to deal with it. It is not even sensible to those who only have a an apparent reality. You should be upset. You should be bothered. You should be depressed. You should be down. You should walk around uh, despondent. You you should. But but what's happening is you don't look like your situation. That's because going on at the same time that your apparent reality is happening, there is a faith reality. And the faith reality is defying your apparent reality. That's the faith fa factor, which is always at war with the flesh factor. And that's all I have because I'm, I'm uh, getting too excited about this. This is a real practice. This is a real practice. This is a real practice. You have to speak from your faith reality because we walk by that reality and not by sight. And in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, he's saying, hey, I'm not looking at what's happening to what I have. I'm looking at what I have and what will happen to what God has for me. Not looking at this body and what's happening to it. That's, yeah, these bodies are wearing down. But I'm looking, I'm looking at the promise of another body, a house not made with hands. I'm looking at another body. And so while this body is the king and this apparent reality, my faith reality gives me comfort for any traumatic apparent reality. That's all I All right. Let me say good morning to all of you. And it is my prayer that your rest was pleasant and that it rejuvenated your heart and your body and your soul. Um, I tell you what, nowadays I value rest more than I used to in my younger days. Uh, <laughs> I mean, rest is becoming high on my value system. Um, the, uh, the, you know, before you just you get up early and and go to bed late uh, now i am making my way the goal by the end by six o'clock is to begin your descent my descent into the, in, into the bed because uh, i understand the value of it it's good to wake up refreshed and rejuvenated i want to thank again uh, brother thomas for this op opportunity to kind of be with you all and uh, be a part of this Faith Factor series. Now, on this morning, I want to, and I will be sharing my screen, I want to um, I want to delve into something and kind of um, look at living uh, against the lies. Um Faith is powerful, uh, but faith is, and the power of faith is neutral. Please understand, 
that the power of faith is very neutral. And I'm going to explain that uh, here in a moment. I want to talk about living against the lie. And um, in regards to faith, okay, I, I want us to think about this for a moment. Right? Have you ever experienced being lied on, lied about, or lied to? I want, I want, us, I want us to think about this. Um, how did it make you feel? Were you hurt? Uh, did it make you angry? Um, you know, um, it's a terrible thing to be lied on. Um, and in any way, for an untruth um, to go out concerning you, uh, for even a, and an untruth doesn't have to necessarily mean just a lie. It can be a, an exaggeration. It can be um, uh, something that is um, uh, a slander. It can be anything. The, the thing is a lie by 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 way of deception. You know, has, has that ever happened to you in your life? Um, uh, did you want to vindicate yourself? Because human nature is, we, we kind of want to vindicate ourselves. In other words, uh, sometimes when somebody lied on us or about us, we want to chase it sometimes, and we, we we try to stop the damage that the lie is doing to ourselves and even to those who are close to us. Um, and I, and so, how do you how did you go about it? Uh, uh, how did you go about it when you were lied to, and finally the truth came out, and uh, you found out that you had been lied to. And um, another question, have you ever struggled with a lie internally long after it was told? Maybe the lie was told on you. Maybe the lie was told about you. Maybe the lie was told to you. Has it ever lingered in your spirit? Um, have you ever had something, a lie, an untruth, a f something farce uh, linger in your spirit long after it was told. I mean, it's dissipated, it, it's it's diminished, it's gone. But sometimes the impact and the effect uh, will linger inside of you. What are the differences between being lied on, lied about, and lied to? Um, you know, lied on, lied about, and lied to. You know, we know being lied to, it's very direct. Uh, it means that the lie is to you. Being lied about is distant somewhat, um, and it has to do with anything about you. Being lied on could be your word taken and manipulated and changed, and it being said that you communicated that, that you did something, you know, um, uh, that you did not do, that you endorsed something that you did not endorse. Um, being lied to is is uh, is the part that many of us um, that sometimes we don't feel as emotionally bothered by, and like we do being lied about and lied on. And the reason why I'm going through this is not to talk about lies because the, the reality is that if you've ever been lied about, if you've ever been lied on, if you've ever been lied to, you know the pain. Uh, you are you know uh, with great experience how that hurts. And of course, there are some people that have gotten past it that don't let it bother them at all. Uh, and that might be you. But at some point, uh, it hurt. You had to grow to that point. Um, um, I want to go to a text, uh, John 8, 44. We're going to bounce around a little bit this morning. John 8, 44. For you are the children. Jesus is responding to the Jews, and he's responding to some of them who are bragging and debating with him about their lineage. They, they, they're saying, we are from Abraham. I, Abraham is our father. We be Abraham's seed. Uh, but I want us to understand something about our Savior. He was not passive 
he was not a passive uh, person. Uh, he didn't walk around, uh, you know, saying things in ways as to not to offend. There were parts of Jesus's ministry where he was very direct, where he didn't pull any punches. And what he said was so sharp that it rattled those he was talking to emotionally. And this is one of those times. They're bragging about Abraham being Abraham's seed. And Jesus says, for you are the children of your father, the devil, and you love to do the evil things he does. He was a murderer from the beginning. He, was, he has always hated the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, it is consistent with his character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Now, he first says that these people are of are children of their father, the devil. He describes to de the devil in ways that basically show that uh, they have the same qualities uh, that their father has, right? He was a murderer from the beginning. One of the overarching qualities of, their, of what Jesus is saying is that there is no truth in them and that uh, he is a liar and that not only is he a liar, but he is the father of lies. Uh, all lies stem from him, everything that lies in in untruth comes from the devil. And of course, this was very offensive to them. Jesus was, again, not playing with them. You know, Jesus was not. He was not being gentle in this moment. And sometimes we paint this picture of Jesus where he's, uh, sometimes we paint a picture where he's telling parables and 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 riddles and and kind words of encouragement. But one aspect of Jesus's ministry was that he rebuked, and this was a sharp rebuke. Here's some other things I want us to look at as we build this. In Job, chapter one, verses nine through eleven. Now, this lesson is not going to be, this lesson is not about us lying, right? Um, and this is where we're going based on these texts. First, we identify that the devil's nature, that his very character is that he doesn't abide in the truth. He, is, he hates the truth. He is a liar. He is a murderer. He's a he's the father of lies. That's the overarching quality and characteristic. In Job 1, verses 9 through 11, Satan replied to the Lord, yes, but Job has good reason to fear God. You have always put a wall of protection around him and his home and his property. You have made him prosper in everything he does. Look how rich he is but reach out and take away everything he has and he will surely curse you to your face. This is a lie, okay? Satan tells this lie, okay? Based, and I'm gonna explain that in a minute. Look, in second, look at Job chapter two, verses four and five. Satan replied, skin for skin. A man will give up everything he has to save his life, but reach out and take away his health, and he will surely curse you to your face. That's the lie. I need you to know that the lie happens before we fulfill it. There is a cosmic lie on all of our lives. <laughs> there is a lie on all of our lives, and the lie is by the enemy. Now, Job had not done anything, but Satan is speaking a lie. And he's speaking a lie because he knows, he doesn't know what Job is going to do, but he knows what he's going to try. And the devil's job is to speak the lie in advance and nudge us and push us and provoke us and move us to fulfill the lie that he spoke aforetime. Okay, that's the lie. He's doing what he does. Okay, uh, here Job is living his life. And in the meantime, there's a whole conversation going on in, in, in the heavenly places. 
and somebody's lying on him. And he had uh, not of what he had done, but what he will do. Uh, it's something to think about that uh, we're being lied on. And the devil has lied on and about us. And the reason why he lies to us is to get us to operate in the lie that he's told on and about us. This is called living against the lie because we as people of God, uh, we have to live against a lie that's already on us. There's a lie over us before we were even born. And it shows up in different ways. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. Job chapter 2 in the Amplified Version, verses 9 uh, and 10. Look at what happens. Then his wife said to him, Do you still cling to your integrity and your faith and trust in God without blaming him? Is that what you're doing, Job? Well, look, curse God and die. But he said to her, you speak as one of the spiritually foolish women who speaks, ignorant and oblivious to God's will. Shall we indeed accept only good from God and not also accept adversity and disaster? In spite of all this, Job did not sin with words from his lips. Do you see this? The lie was told before about him and on him. And now the lie has descended. The lie has descended. And now it's happening in his realm through his wife. Uh, and, and what is this about? This is about moving him to fulfill a lie that was told about him. And you said, you're going to say, maybe you're saying, where's the faith factor? Hold on, it's coming. Because there's a powerful principle here. Here's an aspect of the, of the enemy we should also consider. Revelation 12, 9 and 10, the great dragon, the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, the one deceiving the whole world, was thrown down to the earth with all his angels. Then I heard a loud voice shouting across the heavens. It has come at last and power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters has been thrown down, it should be thrown down to earth. The one who accuses them before our God day and night. Watch this. Before our God day and night. Satan accuses them before. Does that, that sound similar to what we just read in Job? Accuses them. And that accusation is based on a lie. It's based on a lie. And it's based on a lie before time. Um, it's like <laughs> somebody saying you did you 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 know you did something or that you're going to do it, or that it's just as good as if you did it before you even acted upon it. Well, Satan lies before time. And then he descends the lie so that we can actually fulfill the lie he is saying against us. All right. Now, here's here, here's just a few things just exploring these texts. Characters were God, Satan, Job, and Job's wife. The situational, situational context. If you read Job, he begins, he wants access to Job to send him through crisis and trauma and hardship and difficulty, etc. Why? Because he, the enemy, wants to fulfill the lie that he told ahead of time. He wants Job to live in the lie that he told ahead of time. Satan's attempt. That's it. I want you to live in the lie. Job's wife's response, look, you're holding your integrity. Satan is pulling out all stops, moving through people, moving through people in his proximity, his wife. Why? Because I lied on you. I told an untruth about you, and I need you to fulfill the lie that's on you. Uh, okay, what, what are the lies beforehand? He's going to curse you to your face. Um, he'll turn against you. He's not going to keep his integrity. That's the aforehand lie. Okay. 
here, here we go. Here's the living a life. That is, this is what living against the lie, right? Living against the lie is living a life that is the very contradiction of satanic lies to us. Where do those show up? They show up in our childhood. We acquire these lies in our childhood. And when, when our hearts are tender, some of us, uh, and, and I'm not saying all of them are traumatic, but and all of them are what we would call, uh, you know, giant big lies, if you would. But but they're lies, right? And what are the lies on us? Before we even develop uh, in full understanding, sometimes the lie come in the form of generational generational issues. Okay. Um, you know, your father was this, your grandfather was this, as you, you were a child, and you're going to be this. That's the lie. Living against the lie is living a life that is the very contradiction of satanic lies to us, about us, and on us by accepting God's truth about us. How do we do it? We have to accept God's truth. The lie must be replaced, okay? Here's the faith factor. Remember, I said that faith is neutral, very neutral, living against the lie, right? The lie both thrives off of faith and can be discredited by faith. Faith is so powerful and so neutral that even a lie can live off of faith. Do you see this? This is why, this is why. The Bible is, and the, the Holy Spirit is constantly encouraging us to have faith in God and that Jesus' ministry was a ministry of turning people to believe in him because faith is powerful. No matter which direction it goes in, it still retains its power because the lie, even a lie, drives off of faith. And the very same lie can be discredited by faith, okay? Lies only work if they are believed, okay? And guess what? The truth works if they are believed. You see the neutrality of lies, of, of, of faith. Faith can discredit a lie, stop a lie from driving. Um, but faith can also cause the lie to drive. So when we say we walk by faith, there's something in hanging in the balance. What's hanging in the balance is the lie that's on us. Whether we will live in it or live against it depends on where we put our faith. It depends on the faith factor. When a person with all of their might goes away from God, goes away from God, there are a series of, of lies that they have put their faith in. Okay, the prodigal son, he went far to, to the far away country, and he wasted his substance on. He had this 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 departure. That departure was living in the lie that he that he can make it out there without his father, and that he needed to be independent. There is a battle, and the battle. Is 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 about faith. What are you placing your faith in? And whatever you place your faith in, you will live in or live against. Okay, wherever you put your faith. Uh, Jesus lived against the lie, right? Um, lies he lived against. He was called a blasphemer in John 10, 30 through 33. He was called a drunkard and a glutton. In Matthew 12, 24, he was called uh, having, doing his power, his miracles by the power of Beelzebub. But what did it mean that he lived against that the lie? It means that his life was the very contradiction of satanic lies to us, uh, to him, right? And, you know, um, about him and on him. And that he accepted God's truth. Jesus did that by faith in God. It was the faith factor. It was, I trust what God is saying 
allow me, okay? So here's the key to living against the lie, right? You have to know what God says about you. Here's the faith factor. You and I have to believe what God says about us. Now, 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 we're we're talking, we're talking about some issues that 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 hit some tender spark, spots in our heart because me, there are a lot of people living in in a lie that that Satan has over them, and the only reason why they're living in it is because but they believe it. It's because of the faith factor. You see how the faith factor will get you, can lead you away from God, right? Or can lead you to God if the faith is in the wrong thing, right? So faith doesn't become any less powerful when it's misappropriated. And that's something we should keep in mind. Faith does not become any less powerful when it's misappropriated. It will, it, watch this. Even Romans 10, 17, there is a principle in there. If we were to, to look at the principle, Romans 10, 17, uh, the application of the principle is part B of that verse. The principle is part A. So then faith cometh by hearing. That's the principle. Here's the application. And hearing by the word of God. The principle, faith cometh by hearing. The application. And hearing cometh by the word of God. The principle, faith cometh by hearing. And the application, and hearing comes by the word of God. You, you take the application and change it. Faith cometh by hearing. And remember, that's what the devil will do. He, he hates the truth. He hijacks all things that are true and all things that are right. And he inverts it. So it's faith cometh by hearing. He knows the principle. But he wants to eradicate hearing coming by the word of God because he knows that faith is so powerful that the application of it will send you just as forcefully and just as uh, just as fast into the other direction away from God because faith comes about by hearing. The principle is if you if you believe it, it comes about by what you hear. So we and you and I have to watch what we believe and we have to be discerning with what we hear because faith will come about by our hearing. And this is why Paul says, and hearing by the word of God. So we have to know what God says about you. You got to know what God says about you because faith will come by hearing. And the devil offers a lies so that we can live in the lie. Lies like, like you're not worth much or lies like uh, you, you made a mistake that will follow you the rest of your life. You, you're ruined, right? You need to know that God's goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of your life. But if you don't know that, what you hear in your spirit is, a, is, is, is that you are unsavable, that it's unsalvageable, that you cannot change, that you cannot make, uh, that you cannot, that you, you don't and cannot repent, and that you're always going to be doomed by whatever's in your past, because faith cometh by hearing. And if you hear the wrong thing and receive the wrong thing, when you don't know and counter it with what God says, then your faith will have you, your very faith will have you living in the life. And God is calling us to live against Satan's lies. What does God say about you? What does God say about you? And this was a class I taught and thought it would be appropriate for that, uh, for this, uh, this morning, because we talk about the faith fact that there's a myriad of scriptures on faith a myriad faith is one of uh it is it is the bedrock of 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 the of all theology you know faith um, it is the bedrock of the word of god faith examples of faith in the old testament examples but not just faith 
faith in God, okay? Not just faith, faith in God. And why is it? Why is that such a big deal? Why does that Holy Spirit make that such a big deal? Because faith is already at work in the world. And this is why it is the enemy's job, according to 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, to blind the minds of those that, that believe not, not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Why? I have to blind you to the truth, because if you believe the truth, you, there's a possibility that if your faith is in what God says, you will live in that truth. And to live in that truth by faith is to live against Satan's lie. This is why the world is the way it is. The world is the way it is because of faith. <laughs> Not faith in God. But the world is as bad as it is because of faith living in the lies that Satan tells. The faith factor is everywhere. It is just not in the kingdom. It is in Satan's kingdom. He is called the God of this world, and he knows how to work faith against humanity. He knows how to work faith against humanity. The reason why we fall victim to fear is because we believe something. Fear is the product of faith. <laughs> and sometimes that faith, that, that thing we believe can be a total lie. It can be the it can be the anticipation of what we're afraid of. And we start believing the anticipation. We respond to so many things that haven't happened yet. That's that's what that's that's the nature of the devil to lie aforetime. Well, I know this is not going, and I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna do this, but I know it's not you know it's gonna fall apart. But I'm gonna try it anyway. The devil has you lying aforetime. Like it's it's you 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 can't say that. And if you believe that, then the devil is playing the game of taking something very powerful and turning it. And God wants us to take it back and live against every lie that the devil has over our lives. And sometimes those lies go as deep as what we were told when we were ch children, what we ex we were exposed to when we were tenderhearted, what we what experiences we've had when when we were not when we were not as mature as we are. And there's a lie over our lives. And so the devil pushes us and nudges us and tempts us and tackles us and 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 oppresses us and allows Christ and 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 watch this causes crisis and trauma in our lives, just like Job. Why? Because I, I this is what Satan says. I lied about you and I need you to fulfill it. And the only way you can fulfill it is you can't be trusting God. You can't be having faith in God. I need you to believe this lie. But God is calling us to live against his lie. And that's all I have this morning for you. I hope that, that this will help somebody because some of us have been in bondage. And when I say us, I'm talking about the people of God. I know, I know that uh you know, in my own life, there are some lies I had to live against, some mindsets, some some things that the devil has has through the voices of others even suggested. And if this, and if Satan could do it, he will have us living in a lie, fulfilling something he already said in the health and profession profession. Uh, they would call it a self fulfilling prophecy. Um. But of course, the spiritual depth of it all is that Satan knows himself, the power of faith. And, and this is why he hates the truth, because living in God's truth, when people buy into what God said, when you and I buy into what God says about us, 
then uh, we live against his lie. So how do we know what God says about, how do you and I know what God says about us? We know by staying in his word, things like this. Know what God says about us, right? You got to know, you, you got to know the promises he gives us. You got to know the assurances he gives us. You got to know the strength he gives us. We got to know the, the we got to know uh, the blessings he gives us. We got to know what God says about us, right? That he loves us uh, and that, uh, that he cares about us, right? So that when the time comes and the lie that's over our lives is that you're not going to be able to handle this. You can know what God says. Well, God says I can cast my care upon him because he cares for me. I can cast them. Upon him. I don't have to live in this space and in this place. I can live against that lie by living in God's truth by faith. All right. All right. All right. Um, uh, let me say good morning to you all and uh, uh, grand rising, as you as you all say. And uh, God has given us another day, and another day is another chance, another chance to love, another chance to forgive, another chance to give, another chance to live, another chance to get it right, to get it right, to right the wrongs that we have made another chance to uh, encourage someone another chance to say hello to those we love another chance to make an impact in this world uh, and another chance to give god some glory bring god some glory uh, and and we're certainly thankful that god has made his decision to give us all another chance whenever we wake up in the morning um that 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 could be our our anthem whoa wait a minute i'm up he's given me another chance there's something else god wants me to do this there's some some other way god wants me to bring him glory god gives us this every day this clear canvas if you would he gives us a clear canvas and he gives us a box of crayons and he says draw something with this day that will bring me glory so when you wake up in the morning, just imagine that you're waking up to a clear canvas and God is saying that whatever mistakes you made on yesterday's canvas, uh, that's gone. Now here's a clear canvas. Here's another box of crayons. You draw something that brings glory to my name. And that's that's the beauty of getting another day. Uh, I've been uh, I've been blessed just to be on uh, this this uh, Zoom series, and I'm thankful to uh, Thomas for the invite. Um, thankful to Thomas for considering me, and this has been as much of a blessing for me than I, I hope it's been uh, for you. Um, this this series is um, definitely needed, uh, definitely needed in my life, uh, because faith, just because you have it, let me just say this, faith, just because you have it does not mean it's strong. <laughs> just because you have it does not mean it's strong. You can have, you can have batteries. Uh, if you're like us, we... We have batteries sometimes, and whenever we take batteries out of anything, an electronic, sometimes we don't throw the batteries away. Sometimes we put them in the drawer, uh, you know, and, I, you know, we'll make the mistake of doing that. And then when it comes time to need those batteries again, the question is asked, do we have batteries? And then and it's, it's, so I'll, maybe our daughter say, we have batteries, there's batteries in the drawer. But that doesn't help because just because we have batteries doesn't mean they're charged. So faith is a little more than just something you have. It's something that has to be strengthened. And the only way faith is strengthened is it's tested. 
And you can't rely on a faith that has not been tested. We can't proclaim to have a faith that has not been tested. The faith factor demands that the faith is tested to be gauged. It is gauged by being tested. We can say we have faith. We can say we trust God. We can say we depend on him. We can say, I've learned how to lean on Jesus. But you and I cannot really make that claim until we find out that we can't lean on other things we've been leaning on. And it will show us if our faith is strong enough to lean on Jesus. So faith is like one of those things that um, that proves to be authentic with testing. Uh, on this morning, br briefly, I kind of want to end. I'm going to go now and share. And I want to talk about appraised by Christ. Um, I just talked about tested. Um, only one who knows what our faith is really is and now let me tell you god knows the level of faith we have god knows how strong our faith is um he doesn't have to test it for him to know <laughs> our faith is tested for us to know <laughs> god knows everything god knows what our faith is like when we're talking about our faith uh and when G god came in flesh Jesus Christ's son and walked among us um, and 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 ministered in this world uh, there there were there was a time where he appraised and there were a couple of times where he appraised faith on the spot it was like taking a car to a dealership and um and to sell your car and they just um, they look at it very briefly and say, hey, uh, this car is good. Well, if the person looking at it is the one who manufactured the car and have been watching the car and made the car and knows how to tell what the car uh, does when it's good, he, he's able to he doesn't have to inspect it with a bunch of questions. And Jesus was able to appraise faith. Uh, a couple of times. No text. Um, Luke chapter 7, verses 2 through 9. Luke chapter 7, verses 2 through 9. At that time, the highly valued slave of a Roman officer was sick and near death. When the officer heard about Jesus, he sent some respected Jewish elders to ask him to come and heal his slave. So they earnestly begged Jesus to help the man. If anyone deserves your help, he does. They said, for he loves the Jewish people and even built a synagogue for us. So Jesus went with them. But just before they arrived at the house, the officers sent some friends to say, Lord, don't trouble yourself by coming to my home. For I am not worthy of such an honor. I am not even worthy to come and meet you. Just say the word from where you are. And my servant will be healed. I know this because I am under the authority of my superior officers, and I have authority over my officers. I only, I only need to say go, and they go, or come, and they come. And if I say to my, to my slaves, do this, they do it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed, turning to the crowd that was following him. He said, I tell you, I haven't seen faith like this in all Israel. And when the officer's friends returned to his house, 
he found the slave completely healed. And again, Christ the praised. And this text is uh, very poignant. And of course, being that Jesus says these words, but says these words powered by emotion. And the emotion that Jesus is empowered by is amazement. God, the Son, God who made all things in the world and made the world itself. Jesus, the one who it is said in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. Jesus, the one who with his Father spoke the world into existence. Jesus, the one who would walk on water and heal sick people, raise dead people, one who has formed every living being from the ants scurrying along the ground to the elephant marching with power through, through, the, through the jungle. That Jesus... God the Son is amazed, amazed by a man's faith. Here's something to note, that this man who Jesus is talking about, he is and was not a Jew. Now, the Bible says that uh, Jesus came to the, you know, to the Jews first. So Jesus is making this statement of amazement. And he says, I have not seen this kind of faith, this, this magnitude of faith in all Israel. And he's talking about a man who is not even part of his people. Uh, John 1 says he came to his own and his own Receive them not, but as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become sons of God. But this man is not a Jew, and Jesus yet commends this, this man. He was not even a disciple of Christ. Um, he was not one in the multitude behind Christ, following him. Um, he was not exposed to his teachings directly anyway. Okay, he was not directly exposed to his teachings. He did not hear from Jesus up to this point. He had only heard about Jesus, but he had the faith factor. There's a misconception that in order to exercise faith, you have to be presently engaged and a lot of things that other people are presently engaged in. In order to exercise faith, you have to be on the front row of the things uh, that happen. That you have to be on the front row of the congregation, and not literally, but uh, that you have to be engaged and involved. Yes, we should be engaged and involved. Yes, we should. Uh, uh, we should be part of our fellowships. And yes, we should be active. And yes, we should be present. And yes, we should be involved. And yes, uh, we should be engaging others and engaging Christ. And, uh, and yes, we should be busy. But this is very interesting uh, because it shows that faith doesn't become more potent because you're present. Faith doesn't become more potent because you're active. Faith's potency doesn't increase because you're busy. Uh, you can be bedridden and faith be as potent as the one who is involved and one who is doing busy work. Faith doesn't need the activity 
uh, or the busyness of its holder for faith to be potent. This man was not even as connected as others. Uh, he was definitely not as connected because he wasn't even part of the group who Jesus was sent to first. Um, he wouldn't even qualify to uh, be one chosen as uh, an apostle in book of Acts because he uh, didn't follow Jesus from the time of his baptism uh, to the time of his ascension. Uh, he, he would have been scorned uh, by some of the upper echelon of Jews because he was an employee for the Roman government. And many of them had issues with uh, those who worked uh, in Roman government, uh, except to say that this man had a heart for the people of God. He had a heart for God's people. He was kind to God's people. And yet, that was his only connection, that and the faith factor. Um, I, I want to say this because sometimes faith is appraised by busyness, and sometimes faith is appraised by activity, and sometimes faith is appraised by presence at uh, at everything and 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 it, oh, involvement, but these are not these are not the indicators of faith necessarily. These can be the product of faith, but these are not the indicators of faith's potency. Um, keep in mind that when the Son of God went to present themselves before the Lord, Satan came in among them. The faith Satan has a a belief in God, but he does not have a faith and dependency on God. So being present does not uh, indicate anything about the potency and the, uh, and it does not quantify faith. This man didn't have any of these things, but yet he had one thing going for him. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, I say he didn't even have presence because nowhere in this story, in Luke's account, does this man have a face-to-face -face interaction with Jesus. There's always a middle person. There's always someone going in between, um, uh, kind of like um, uh, Naaman and Elisha. And now Naaman and Elisha never connected with each other. It was always a messenger and because faith does not demand that you stand in the presence and be actively connected physically to the person. It demands that you believe. Uh, faith doesn't come by seeing. It comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So that's something to note. And this is um, this is what uh, is the is the foundation to why this man's faith is appraised the way it is, uh, because he had the faith factor in the absence of having other things. And I want to encourage it because there may be a time, there may be a time uh, where you can't be, you and I can't be as active. There may be a time. I mean, many, many of us might feel energetic and empowered, and and some of you are young, and and some of us are young. I'm not going to say you. I'm, I still feel youthful, um, and some of us are active and able to do, and and able to fulfill things, and able to, to to, uh, and have the capacity to be busy for the Lord. Uh, our mind, we have the mental capacity to be able to uh, to know 
scripture and be able to quote scripture and be able to rightly divide and be able to exegete and to be able to expose the text and to be able to do all of these busy things for the Lord. But there may come a time in our lives where uh, sickness or aging hinders us from being able to be as active, to be as present. There may come a time uh, where uh, where we cannot uh, bring ourselves to uh, to the to the gathering of God's people, there may come a time uh, when we're not able to be as mentally acute as we've been, and we may not remember where scriptures are, and we may not remember uh, where where in the Bible common scriptures and familiar scriptures are located, and we may not remember how to quote them right, and our busyness is dumbed down and dies down into a disabled hush. It does not mean that our, our faith can be diminished, because even if our bodies should no longer participate and cooperate with the will of our minds. And even if our minds uh, don't function uh, according to the will and uh, the desires that we have, and even if we can't remember scripture, you can, you and I can still retain a potent faith in Christ. We may come to the age or to the day where we don't know and have scripture memorized. But if we know Christ, I, I, I can't tell you the, the amount of times I've visited members of the church in their homes or in their hospitals who once were vibrant and active and 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 present and 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 involved and because of age or sickness, uh, their involvement began to wane and their activity began to wane and everything that uh, that made people familiar with who they were and, and their, their activity began to come to a hush and their mind and thinking faculty began to diminish and how even those people who could not even remember uh, my full name, if you, if when I, when I talked about the Lord, they'd say, pray for me. How is it that they can retain who Jesus is when they can no longer retain where the scripture is? How is it that they can retain who Jesus is when they can no longer get up and move to and fro? And all of them have not been up in age. Some of them have been younger people who have fallen to some kind of illness, uh, younger people who have fallen to some kind of cancer who have, that has ravished their body and mind, yet they're laying in the bed of affliction and they can still exercise though not their bodies, they can still exercise their faith. So this man didn't have the, all the connectivities of the crowd that were behind Jesus, but he did have the faith factor. Faith factor, I, I want to talk about you know, um, faith factor principles. Number one, the less it takes for faith to happen is the greater it is. The less it takes for faith to happen, the greater it is. And what I mean by that is some people need God to do a whole lot to believe. But the potency of faith is in our propensity for faith to come by hearing for faith to come by hearing. Um, Jesus would do miracles and say things like, blessed are those that don't see and believe. Why? Because that faith is a potent faith because it just takes a word. So the less it takes for faith to happen is the greater it is. And for in our lives, sometimes, uh, you know, we need, 
We need God to do it again and do it again and do it again and do it again for us to, to really believe. And, and for some, if God said it and if God said he would do it and, if I, and, and being familiar with his promises, we believe that. And so, and so as our faith grows and our faith uh, becomes more potent. What happens is it takes life less for our for our faith to exist because one um, we learn to trust him because of knowing who he is, and he doesn't have to he doesn't have to heal us for us to know he's a healer. He doesn't have to he doesn't have to deliver us for him. For us to know he's and trust that he's a deliverer, uh, uh, the 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 less it takes for faith to happen is the greater it becomes, and that faith becomes great not based on external maturity, but spiritual infancy. And I'm not talking about infancy as an in immaturity, but Jesus talks about having childlike faith and. Um, uh, and the Bible talks about having childlike faith, not like Paul talks about it when he says, you know, you uh, you should be drinking, eating meat, and you know, you you still um, are babes. Not like that, but the nature of a child, the nature of a child, uh, um, where it doesn't take a lot to happen for children to believe. It doesn't take just a word from 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 daddy, a word from mama. Uh, I'm coming to pick you up after school. Okay. Not, are you sure you're coming? Not, uh, should I make, an, you know, who's going to come get me if you don't? But I, I'll be there to pick you up after school. And okay. And Okay is the answer. And not only is okay the answer, but at the school, there's a tiptoe anticipation to see mama or daddy or grandma be there. Why? Is it because, is it because she's, uh, she did a miracle before she, she told me that? No, it because she said it. Uh, and so the faith factor, the less it takes for faith to happen is the greater it is. Because faith should only come by hearing. Uh, faith, true faith and strong faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. God shouldn't have to do it over and over and over again. Faith factor two. Faith is an acknowledgement of Christ's power and person. Okay? Power and person. Now, this man, and I'm going to go back. This man, and I, I put these... Um, Highlights there, because I want I want to distinguish some things. Um, faith is an acknowledgement of Christ's power and His person. Now, watch this: His person, right? Who is Christ in the eyes of this man? This man sends messengers, and in verse six. They call him Lord, right? They call him Lord. Uh, at relaying the message of this man, the man says through his messengers, Lord. He acknowledges that he's just not some man I've heard rumors about. He says, Lord. Now, that's a humble position, and that humility comes at the cost of acknowledging the person of Christ. And then he says, I am not worthy of such an honor. You're coming here. I'm not worthy of such an honor. I'm not even worthy to come and meet you. Now, I want you to look at how that contrasts to the Jews who came and who, 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 um, who he sent. Some respected Jews, right? Jesus came to his own and the positionality of the Jews that he sent were to plead with Jesus to help the man. And the premise was not faith. The premise was help this man because he deserves your help. <laughs> Why? 
He loves the Jewish people and even built a synagogue for us. So their highlight was what he did, and there was nothing wrong with that. But the man's attitude, while they postured the man as to be one who deserved it, the man himself, in acknowledging the person of Christ, recognized that he was not worthy. They said he's worthy. He said he's not. They were looking at his status and the things he did to help the Jewish people and to build a synagogue. They were looking at the church building he built. <laughs> they were looking at the synagogue he helped them build. They were looking at the contribution he made. <laughs> and based on that, their appraisal was that he was worthy. This man's appraisal of himself was that he was not worthy of Jesus to come to him. Neither was he worthy to even come and meet Jesus. This humility was an acknowledgement of Jesus's person. He feels unworthy, not because of simply his own sinfulness, but the magnitude of Jesus's person. Um, and now, not only is it an acknowledgement of his person, but also his power. This right here, he says, just say the word from where you are, and my servant will be healed. Now he's acknowledging his power. I heard about you, but I believe what I heard so much so that I'm acknowledging that you have power to not even be in my locality. You can do it without, with minimal proximity to me. I'm acknowledging that you have the power to do it. And the reason why I know you have the power, and that's both authority and ability here, and I know you can just do it with a word. I know you can do it because I, too, am a man of authority, and I can send my officers. I know what it's like to be sent. I know what it's like to send. And perhaps in his mind, he thought he could have thought he would send somebody to do it. But I don't believe that's the case because Jesus appraised this man. Uh, he appraised this man. Apparently, what he heard about Jesus, he believed to the point where he believed that Jesus did not have to, unlike Naaman, Jesus didn't have to wave his hand over, over the leper, right? Over the situation. He did not have to be present. He did not have to have physical presence. And the Bible says that this man acknowledged the person and the power of Jesus, his authority and his ability, his authority and his ability that you can send your word like I've sent these messengers. You can send just your word as, like I sent these messengers and your word will take the trip that you were about to take. Your word will walk the dusty roads. Your word, uh, your word would, would, would transport from your lips to my situation and in transporting from your lips to my situation it would bring about the revelation of your power and i'm telling you that this man his faith was amazing to jesus amazing to god the son because he had that faith factor and faith is always an acknowledgement of christ's power and person whether it's verbally acknowledging it or posturing ourselves and, and believing in such a way to where it acknowledges that Christ has the power and he is the one to do it. Uh, faith factor number three, familiarity and misappropriating esteem can diminish faith. Okay, the Jews that were sent, um, they esteemed this man to be worthy. He, de he did not esteem, as I said, himself. And the reason why they're doing this is because 
Jesus was a Jew. They were the ambassadors from this Roman, uh, this Roman uh, soldier, this Roman um, uh, person of power. And they were the ambassadors. And they were, uh, you know, with, with a good heart, I'm sure, kind of interceding. But they did not recognize in interceding the ones who were Jews did not demonstrate as much faith as this Roman. They were focusing on this man's worthiness instead of focusing on Jesus's power. And so they were appropriating esteem to this man. And whenever we misappropriate esteem, and we deem ourselves or others worthy, and then we are really, we are really misappropriating that. You know, we're really diminishing uh, our own faith because Jesus has the primary worth. Jesus has the primary worth, and 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 so whenever we we think we're worthy, and whenever we 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 think we deserve it, and then we make Jesus and we make God a debtor, and it doesn't take much faith to as much faith to get what somebody owes you to feel like you're owed this, so God is going to give it to me. It takes greater faith, and it takes more stronger faith to know that there's nothing about you that deserves it to understand that there's nothing about you that's worthy, but I'm going to trust you, Lord, and I'm going to trust not only your power and your person, but I'm going to trust your grace. I'm going to trust your grace. I know I'm not worthy. And then finally, faith it should say faith fact before. The greater your assignment is the greater your faith must be. The greater your assignment is the greater your faith must be. Uh, and I'm almost done here, but I want you to see something. Jesus just publicly appraised this man's faith. He appraised it not based on just the statement, but even on his own amazement. The son of God amazed. The amazing son of God amazed my man. A man's faith. Uh, a man who, as I said, was not a Jew, was not in the busy work of of, uh, of those who were who were within closer proximity to Jesus. But yet, here's something very interesting. Matthew has these records, uh, these recordings, uh, not, uh, these uh, historical accounts in Matthew about these times when Jesus is with the creme de la creme of his followers, the 12, and, and even the multitude of followers. And he makes this, this statement that keeps popping up. And if God cares, Matthew 6.30, he makes the statement to his disciples and the multitude on the Sermon on the Mount. And he's talking about God's care for them. He says, and if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? He's talking to Jews. He's talking to the multitude. He's talking to the people who were his disciples. He's, he's talking to the people who were busy around him. He asked them this question, why do you have so little faith? Watch this. Matthew 8, 26. He's talking to the disciples in the storm. Jesus is sleeping on the very boat with them, right? On the very boat with them. He says, why are you afraid? You have so little faith. Wait a minute. He just said about this, this Roman, this non- Jew, this man that was not part of his people, this man who hadn't been following him and watching him do miracle after miracle after miracle, who just heard about him and trusted his word. He just said that this man, he hadn't seen that faith in all Israel, and yet 
these men who had walked with him and were following him and watched and had front row seats to his power. He keeps saying this thing to, why are you afraid? You have so little faith. Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves. Then in Matthew 14, 31, Jesus immediately reached out. And this is when Peter was walking and then sinking on the water. Now, I know we would have appraised this differently. We would have appraised this differently because Peter at least had the wherewithal to step out of the boat and walk on water. And we probably would have said that Peter had stronger faith, especially if we had stayed back and we were still on the boat. <laughs> but Jesus, Jesus gave a different appraisal. Yes, Peter got out of the boat. Yes, Peter said, if it be the, if it's you, let me walk on water. But watch, even with what Peter did, distinguishing him from the rest that were on the boat, Jesus appraised his faith. He says, Jesus, it says, Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. And this is what he says. You have so little faith. The only thing this Roman did was simply hear what Jesus said. I heard, heard about Jesus, and he at no point had front row seats to anything Jesus was doing. He just heard about him and, uh, and never had a face-to-face -face interaction with him, and yet saw Jesus as, as being Lord and himself as unworthy, and yet Jesus... Uh, he didn't walk with Jesus. He didn't talk with him. He didn't sit down under Jesus and hear his teachings. But yet, yet his faith was was called, uh, was appraised as amazing. But Jesus is telling Peter, who actually walked on water for a little bit, you have so little faith. Seems unfair. It seems unfair. And it seems like it's a misappraisal to the, to the naked eye. But it really, it really isn't. Um, Jesus in Matthew 16, 18, he says this same thing to the disciples who are arguing over lack of bread after witnessing Jesus feed thousands with little. Jesus knew what they were saying. They were talking about they they were talking about they didn't have much bread. He says, Here's the appraisal. You have so little faith. Why are you arguing with each other about having no bread? Do you you see a pattern here? Do you see a pattern a pattern of, of men who, who are seeing it over and over and over, who are having direct connection with Jesus incarnate, who are having front row seats to his miracle, miracles, who are having front row seats to his teachings where he declares who he is, where he declares I am the light of the world, where he declares I am the way, the truth, and the light, when he, life, and where he's declaring who he is, uh, where he's letting them know, where he's teaching them that he and the Father are one, and yet they're struggling, right? They're struggling, and they're doubting. Yet they're closer to Jesus, but while they are closer to Jesus, in physical proximity, they are far from Jesus in their faith. And Jesus kept putting up with them. Here in Matthew 17 and verse 20, he says to the disciples, unable to cast out the demon possessed boy after he comes off of the mountain, what we've called the mountain of transfiguration. He says, you don't have enough faith, Jesus told him. I tell you the truth, if you had even as small as a mustard seed faith, you can say to this mountain, move from here, and it would move. Nothing would be impossible. So he's he's rebuking him. He's saying, he's appraising him. You don't, you don't, your faith is little. And what is this word? This word is oligo pistos. Right? Oligo pistos. It means it means to have skill scant of faith, to have little faith, to have faith that is small, and ultimately faith that is weak. It is a faith that still needs 
affirmation or with affirmation has not matured based on the affirmation it receives. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not the absence of faith. It is the weak presence of faith. It's not that you don't have the battery. It's just the battery is not fully charged. And because the battery is not fully charged, its capacity to work an electronic is limited. Um, it's limited because it's there, but it's not maximized. It's there, but it still needs the charge of affirmation. It needs a charge of, of gee, God doing it again. And how many of us still need a charge? How many of us? Now, the faith factor is good. It's wonderful. We applaud it. But like the man whose faith was appraised highly, he didn't need to be among the busyness. He did not need all of that. All he needed was a word. A word, a word, a word. I heard about you. And I know that I'm not worthy for to me. I'm not worthy to be in your presence. And I'm a Roman. Uh, I'm a Roman. And most Romans felt superior to the Jewish community. He says, I'm a Roman. And I am a man of authority. And I am not worthy to be in your presence. And I'm not worthy for you to be in mine. I know me. And I know you, and I acknowledge you. You're the Lord. And you're 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 powerful, and you're 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 your Majesty. You're you're great, and I understand. And our faith will be appraised best by Christ when our appraisal of Christ comes becomes great. When we appraise Christ greatly, it will empower our faith for him to appraise our faith greatly. And this man had a higher appraisal of Christ than the very men who came to him because these men were appraising him and he was appraising Christ. But these disciples, the 12, Peter, James, John, all, all of the guys that we would see in Acts are actively taking the gospel. Um, they kept getting this rebuke. And why did God, why did Christ keep giving him the test? Because of this faith factor, number three, well, number four, uh, the greater your assignment is the greater your faith must be. The Roman was not going to carry the message. Okay. The Roman got the Roman was not going to carry the message, right? He was going. He heard, uh, he heard about Jesus, but he wasn't going to have the assignment of taking the testimony of Jesus throughout the world. These men were, and Jesus did not want these men to ha have faith that still needed affirmation when they were, would preach Jesus to the world. They, they, they didn't need these, he didn't want these men to need another miracle to believe in the power and person of Jesus. So his, so their, their faith had to be constantly tested and appraised and tested and appraised and tested and appraised. I mean, it's like going, you know, you're driving across the country. And so you, you, you get your child checked and you get an oil change and you get your car checked because the journey is too far for you to get halfway across the country and still need an oil change and still need some transmission work. You need to be fully prepared for the assignment of going across. And Jesus tolerated and, and, and kept appraising their faith. So I imagine when Peter James and John, and when the disciples were there in Acts chapter 2, and they began to preach after being filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to go throughout all the world, I'm sure they had their moments when they remember being on the on the boat with Jesus and, and being afraid. I'm sure they had their moments when they reflected back to uh, to being on the boat without Jesus.
Jesus and Jesus walks on the water, bids Peter come. And I'm sure that these moments of small faith where Jesus affirmed their faith empowered their moment when they're now proclaiming the word and the will of Christ. I'm sure they would reflect back and remember these moments. And now they had they would be the carriers of the faith of Christ, his word, his will, and his gospel, um, after having their faith repeatedly appraised. Okay, here's the last slide. Christ highly appraised faith that was based on who he is in comparison to who uh, the centurion was. Recognize the power he has and trusted him uh, to not be limited in his deliverance, right? That's he appraised that faith. It was based on recognizing the power he has and trusting him not to be limited in his deliverance. In other words, I know you can do it. And I know that there's no limit to how. Okay. I need you to walk away with this, that the faith factor, Lord, I know you can do it. And I know there's no limit to how. I know you can do it. And I know there's no limit to how, because trying to assess the how will sometimes affect the fact that we know he can do it. I know you can do it, and I know there's no limit to how. Lord, I know you can take, take, take care of me. And Lord, I'm praying for this job. That's the how. God blesses you with the job, right? But what happens when you lose the job? Sometimes we think that's the only way God can do it. But the faith factor says, Lord, I know you can do it. And I know you're not limited as to how. How you deliver it, I know you're not limited as to how. So that when the job keeps saying no, and the job market keeps saying no, 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 you're not depending on the how. You're depending on knowing that he can do it. He can still take care of you. I don't know. What am I going to eat? Well, I need a job to eat. No, no, there's no limit to how. There's no limit. I, I know you can do it. And I know you can take care of me. And there's no limit to how you can do it. And then voila, you look up. And you've been without a job for two months. And you just keep eating and eating and eating. And, and somebody said, what's going on? Well, I just haven't been working. And it's just kind of be just eating and eating and eating. And that doesn't go together because if you... If you ain't making no money, how are you eating? How are you gaining more work, weight without a job? <laughs> how are you gaining more weight without a job? You, you're being delivered. You're being, you know, you, you, God is delivering you. you. You're being taken. You're having your needs met without the how, the supposed how of your expectation. And I'm not saying you, you, you stay home and be. I'm just saying that the, this man's faith was appraised based on recognizing Christ's power and that he has trusted him to not be limited in his deliverance. I'm trusting you, and I know you can do it. And then finally, the faith factor trusts Christ to write the pages of our lives and add the punctuation without interference from our pen. The faith factor trusts Christ to write the pages of our lives and add the punctuation without interference from our pen. Without saying, no, 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 this is the end. And without saying, no, period. No, that period wasn't written by Christ. That period was written by us. That comma was written by us. Jesus says, keep going. We put a comma. Jesus, Jesus says there's more to come. We put a period. We tr the faith factor that can be highly appraised says, Lord, I know you can do it, and I'm not going to. And I know you're not limited in how. And I know that you can write the pages of my life. And I'm not going to interfere with what you can do in my life. And that's, that's all I have. I hope this blessed someone. <laughs>